guys, welcome to another chemical engineering tutorial brought to you by the KMN student. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the complete design of a single effect evaporator. So before we go into the derivation of the equations and the actual example, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, well, what is a single effect evaporator? Well, in simple terms, a single effect evaporator is simply one that a feed enters at a fixed given temperature along with a saturated steam with its own separate inlet port and the basically the the condensed steam will then leave as condensate and assuming that the system is completely mixed then we can have a concentrated product and an evaporated solution with the same temperature now these are just large vessels but the design concept is generally modelled for evaporators based on the overall heat transfer coefficient, which basically depicts the rate of heat transfer within an evaporator. And the equation that we tend to use is Q equals UA delta T, U being the overall heat transfer coefficient. Now the schematic to better explain this um, is taken from the reference of Transport Processes and Unit Operations by Jan Cockless. And essentially, the description is based off this schematic, whereby we have the feed and the, the steam that come in at two separate ports. We'll have the heat exchanger with the required tubes, so the steam goes through the tubes, and the feed will be um, and other not in contact with the steam, the condensate will fall um, through its own port and we'll have our concentrated product at the bottom and our vapour, which is to go to the condenser, uh, whereby we can turn it back into a liquid. So that's the general principle and that's what we're going to use for the basis of our model and for our example. Now just to help you with uh, a source of some information um, if you're ever coming across uh, like designs at university or if you are in graduate jobs or whatever it may be if you're looking for some typical heat transfer coefficients for evaporators then this is a nice list that you can use as a reference so depending on the type of circulation that you have whether it's natural or forced um, and depending on the configuration of the tubes so whether you have short tubes, long tubes, if they're vertical, if they're horizontal, and so forth. And I've included the SI units, which is the watts per meter squared Kelvin, and the imperial units, which is butte h feet squared degrees Fahrenheit. Now you can clearly see just by analysis here that the difference between the overall heat transfer between natural and forced is considerably higher and again that's that's what we expect but that's out with the scope of this particular um, tutorial but if you're really interested and want to know all about heat transfer we have a lot of heat transfer videos on our YouTube channel I'll put a link in the description uh, to some of them but if you really want to go into the analysis and the details and become a pro at advanced uh, heat transfer then we have a heat transfer course that I'll put a link in the description and you can check that one out if you are interested. Now before we actually look at the example we want to see what equations and how these equations that we're going to use actually come into play because rather than say there's the equation let's see if we can model why we have these heat and material balances. So like anything in engineering or especially chemical engineering we need to establish a material and energy balance with the system so is that a we have a foundation to model and b we have a platform in order to optimize so as we've already mentioned the basic equation of the q equals ua delta t that will allow us for solving the capacity of the single effect evaporator but we will use a rendition of the schematic as a means of deriving the required balances for the equations and this is what we're going to use as our um, reference point 
So again, it's the same schematic. We have feed vapor outlets. We have the condensate um, steam. We have our concentrated liquid and we have our steam coming in here. Now, the nomenclature here is that the lowercase x's are denote the mass fraction of material in the liquid phase. The lowercase represents the mass fraction in the vapor phase. The V's here stand for the vapor um, stream, the L for the liquid stream, the F for the feed stream. Now the capital H here is the enthalpy of the steam and this is the enthalpy of the steam as well. The reason this is lowercase is so is that we have a distinction between the inlet and the outlet because as the heat is given off it will have a different enthalpy. So that's just to, to keep in mind. So that's the nomenclature that we're going to use. So if we start off with just a general overall balance, then what we'll say here is that the, the condensed steam will leave and we'll assume that it's at saturation temperature. So that's why it's TS. So it's saturated steam coming in, saturated liquid coming out the other end. And that means that the enthalpy, as we say, is HS will be the, the enthalpy of the liquid. Now what that tells us is we can actually determine what the latent heat will be. So the latent heat is the temperature associated with a phase change, i.e. we go from the liquid to the vapour or the vapour to the liquid. So that's what we can now do is find the latent heat of the, the steam by this equation here. Now from the general mass balance, we simply say, well, what comes into the system must leave. And we're not accounting for the steam, because remember the steam and the, the feed don't ever mix. It's a heat exchanger. So the steam is in the tubes and the feed material will be um, in the shell part of the heat exchanger. Now, if you want to know how to design a heat exchanger from the very beginning to the very end with every resource that you will possibly need to design a shell and tube heat exchanger, we have a full step-by-step -step blog post on our website. I'll put a link in the description to that um, and you can check that one out. It will give you the entire breakdown um, that you will need to design a shell and tube heat exchanger. But if we come back to this, then we have F equals L plus V because we have um, the feed coming in will be equal to what leaves in the vapour phase and what leaves in the concentrated liquid phase. Now, if we want to express this as a solute balance, i.e. the solid, then we simply add in the mass fractions. Now, you might be asking, well, where did the V go? Well, the V would actually be zero because we wouldn't have any solids in the vapour phase. The vapour phase, we assume, is going to be 100% um, basically solvent-free, uh, sorry, solute-free, i.e. there's no solids. So that's why we can neglect the V term. Now we can consider the heat balance, and this is basically the total amount of heat that enters must leave the system. So we're assuming that isothermal and adiabatic conditions um, whereby we're saying whatever the, the amount of heat brought in from the feed and the steam must be equal to the amount that leaves in all three of these streams. So that's exactly what we do. We say, well, we have the feed plus the steam and we have our HF and we have our HS. So these are the enthalpies of the feed and the enthalpies of the um, steam. And then we'll have that equal to the liquid, concentrated liquid, the vapour and the condensed steam. So again, very, very simple, nice and straightforward. Now, if we want to simplify and we can substitute in the respective latent heat equation from into the above um, equation and we can actually deduce this, whereby we know that the latent heat is going to be the enthalpy of the inlet steam minus the enthalpy of the outlet steam. So we can just tidy this up a bit and it makes it look slightly neater as well. And we'll need that for later on in the questions. So if we take a look at the question uh, that we're going to solve, this is for a single effect um, 
evaporator. If you would like to see a tutorial on how you would do a multi-effect evaporator, then let me know in the comment section um, below. And um, if there's enough interest, we'll make one for a multi-effect evaporator system as well. So here we have a single effect evaporator which concentrates 9072 kilograms an hour of 1% weight salt solution which enters at 311 degrees Kelvin and reaches a final concentration of 1.5 weight percent and the evaporator operates at atmospheric pressure. So that's one atmosphere absolute or 101.325 pascals. Now we have saturated steam which is supplied to us at 143.3 kilopascals and the overall heat transfer coefficient can be taken as 1,400, uh, sorry, 1,740 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So we now have U for the overall heat transfer coefficient. And we need to determine the amount of vapor and the liquid product, as well as the heat transfer area required in order to meet the desired output concentrations. And what we can assume here is that the solution has the same boiling point as pure water. And that's all the information that we need in order to be able to solve this problem. So we're going to use the same chart as we have throughout and we'll use this as our baseline for the model. So the first thing that we'll do is do the overall balance first. What comes in must come out. And we know what the feed is, we were told it was 9072, so we'll pop that in. Now we have two unknowns and we only have one equation. So we have a bit of a problem. We need another piece of information that's going to eliminate a degree of freedom. So what we can do is now perform a solid balance on the system. Because this will actually get rid of the V term. Because we know what the fractions of the feed are and the fractions of the liquid. They were 1% and 1.5% respectively. So when we substitute the values in here, the only unknown becomes L. So that tells us that we have 6,048 kilograms an hour of concentrated liquid. Therefore, now the top product can now be found. Because we simply sub this back in here, and that tells us that we have 3,024 kilograms an hour of vapor being produced in this system. And that is literally as difficult as it gets. Now, in order for us to solve for the heat balance, um, and that allows us then to find the, the heat transfer area, we need some more additional physical properties. And because they weren't all provided to us in the question, we will have to use the assumptions that were provided to us and use them to actually go and find the values. So based on the assumptions um, within the question and the details, we can take the specific heat to be 4.14 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And that's because we are relating this to water. And again, that is where we can take the other piece of information that the boiling point of the dilute solution we can take is the same as the water. Now there is distinctions between dilute and concentrated solutions, and um, again, going to have a lot of detail on that in the heat transfer course um, so if you are interested in that that's a, a really um, detailed kind of advanced um, area of heat transfer but here we're just taking it as that the dilute solution is what we will use as a comparison with water i.e 100 degrees celsius so from what we use as a steam table here, but again, you can get that in any thermodynamic property table, um, we can take the following values. So we can have the enthalpy of the steam, which will come in at 373.2 Kelvin, and that'll give us 2,257. We will have the latent heat of the steam at 383.2, which will give us 2,230 kilojoules per kilogram. And this is the enthalpy of the feed calculation. So we'll have the specific heat capacity of the material, we'll have our feed temperature, and we'll have our reference temperature. And our reference temperature 
we're going to take is 373.2 degrees Kelvin. Because what that allows us to do is make the enthalpy of the liquid equal to zero. So we actually neglect one of the terms. So this entire term will become zero, which makes our life a bit easier. So taking whatever datum temperature you want can really simplify the equations. All it will really influence is the values of the physical properties. So now from here, all you have to do is substitute in the values into this equation, and we work out that the amount of steam required for this operation is 4,108 kilograms per hour. So that's the amount of steam that we are going to require. Now the question is why do we need this? Well we need this because that is going to allow us to determine what the heat transfer area is. And we can do that using Q equals the amount of steam multiplied by the latent heat of the steam. Now the only caveat to this is we need to ensure that we get rid of the time parameter, we want the power or the total amount of heat in watts. So that's where the 1000 divided by 3600 is the conversion of seconds to hours. So that's where we can actually get rid of that because we would have joules per second, which is a watt. So we actually get 2.544 million watts. So just double check that you can, you know, you can make that conversion. Um, and if you, if you're, you know, struggling and want to know how to do it, then please feel free to comment um, in the video and send us an email, and I'll be happy um, to explain it in slightly more detail. If you still aren't 100% sure on how we actually got the the watt or the joule per second. But now we know what Q is, we can then rearrange the Q equals UA delta T. Because the only unknown here is A. Because we now know what Q is, that's the amount of heat, or that's the power. We know what the overall heat transfer coefficient is. We know our temperature difference. And the only thing we don't have is A. So when you solve the, the numbers, you know, you take these away from each other, and multiply it by that, divide it by 2.544 million, we work out that in order for this evaporator to meet the criteria, we need a heat transfer area of 149.3 meters squared. And that's how you would go about solving a single effect um, evaporator system. It's nice and straightforward, but as it says, if you want to see how to do multi-effect evaporators um, in a similar manner, then let me know in the comments and we can look at putting you know a video like this on if there is enough people interested so that's the end of this lesson thanks for watching hopefully this was helpful in understanding how to model and um, solve questions for single effect evaporators if you like this video please like subscribe to the channel it really helps us reach as many chemical engineering students as possible thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing you in another video